So, okay, let me do this question. Um, so, even before I read the question, because of the chapter it's in, I know we are going to be using standard strategy. So let me write down the steps of standard strategy to refer to it as we are going through this um, the problem. So the steps of standard strategy are, first, we need to draw free body diagram. And this is the step that should take you the most time and care because this is the step where it's easy to forget some things and um, oftentimes if you forgot something important then it kind of doesn't matter how well you do the remainder of the steps you your answer final answer will likely be wrong so please make sure when you draw free body diagrams that you pay attention and do it carefully don't miss any forces and don't identify any forces that are not actually there so one once you've drawn free body diagram, then you need to define coordinate axis. And when you define coordinate axis, the main thing that you're looking for is what is the direction of your acceleration. And it usually works out best if you make your positive x axis parallel to the direction of expected acceleration. Once you have that, then uh, on some problems, you'll have to break down forces into components. In this problem, I don't think I'll end up doing that, but let me write it down as a step. And the final step, which will set you up for the rest of the problem solving, is uh, writing down Newton's second law equation. So write down acceleration is equal to net force divided by mass. Oh, you might have seen it written the other way around. Net force is equal to mass times acceleration. This form it makes the causality <laughs> clearer that it's the net force causing acceleration, not the other way around. So that's the steps of the standard strategy. So we will um, just go through it one at a time. So we'll start out with the free body diagrams. Now, I see that in this problem, oh, so let me read the question and see what it is we're being asked for. It says, as shown, the coefficient of kinetic friction between the surface and the larger block. Okay, so there's some kind of a coefficient kinetic friction here. Uh, I'm using two for this. Uh, so this is going to be my mu two. And the coefficient of kinetic friction between the surface. And, okay, so I'm dealing with the friction, two different coefficients that uh, <laughs> I better track. Um, one for one, let's see here. Um, if, uh, uh, so, okay, so we are given the force is some number of newtons and the mass, um, I guess, so we are given basically masses of both objects because this is not the second mass, it's twice the mass, <laughs> so M is that. Uh, what is the tension? Okay, so there's a tension force here that I'll need to, uh, I'll need to be looking for. What is the tension in the connecting string? Okay, that sounds good. I doodled while we are reading the question to make sure that I understood the question, that I didn't miss anything. And I guess in this question, the important thing not to miss is the fact that the the coefficient of kinetic friction is different for the two blocks. So, okay, let me draw a free body diagram. I'll just uh, draw one at a time. And uh, by the way, I see this often where people try to draw forces on this diagram itself, and um, I don't recommend doing that. No, I might not always deduct the points when I see people doing that, but um, so the purpose of a free body diagram is to illustrate forces clearly. You really don't want anything else on your free body diagram that's not force that could uh, confuse things. That's why, why I like to represent the object with a single dot and use this dot as a point to, to anchor all, all my forces. And when I draw forces, it'll look like the forces are coming from the dot and when you're drawing free body diagrams, you're drawing forces on the object. So like there shouldn't be any need to draw forces like this. Um, the way we draw the uh, forces as coming from the dot is because when you draw it that way, it's easier to draw other auxiliary figures or, uh, you know, uh, do things. It's just the diagram is a lot cleaner when you do it that way. So I'm going to need the forces for block M. And I'm going to need the forces for block 2M. Uh, make sure you are drawing separate diagrams for each of your objects. 
So um, I need to stir at this for a while, think through, make sure I include all the forces. Uh, as you're drawing forces, a uh, good things to remember to draw are the forces that your problem gives you. Problem tells you there's a force F on mass M. All right, let's draw that. There's a force of magnitude F acting rightward on mass M. All right, I'm going to have that. Um, and the other, so any explicitly specified forces. And other forces that are good to draw are uh, gravity. Hopefully, once you've done gravity, then, um, then it will give you inspiration for other forces that should be there. So let me draw gravity for both of the objects. I have gravity pulling this mass down, mg, and also gravity pulling this mass down, 2mg. And as you're completing your free body diagram, the question you should ask yourself is, um, have I drawn all the forces? And by that I mean, from the question description, you have an intuitive sense of the direction of acceleration, in what direction your objects should be moving. So you can't draw straight line. <laughs> um, so you already have some sense that acceleration should be rightward. So when you've drawn all the forces, the forces you have drawn should match that sense of acceleration you have for both blocks. Now, in the diagram I have so far, I have acceleration going like this and acceleration going like this. Okay, those are obviously not right. So I need something to counter that gravity. So, um, so I need a normal force. Um, <laughs> so that's where this understanding that it's touching a surface and there should be contact force from the surface is useful. So let me draw a normal force. Uh, I have a sense there will be different normal forces, so let me label this N1 and label this N2. Okay, so block M looks okay. Um, it looks like we can get a rightward acceleration. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so, so you might be uh, justified in thinking this free body diagram is complete. It's not. We have two more forces I need to need to include, but we'll get there. Now, as you look at mass 2n, uh, it's clearly missing some forces because we do have an innate sense that it should be accelerating to the right. And I need rightward uh, force to get rightward acceleration. So this is where you look at the setup. Uh, think about what can provide that rightward force. And this is where the hint I give you about the types of force is useful. The only single non-contact force in this class is gravity. So all forces other than gravity, you should be able to identify something that's touching the object. So you will look for the things that could be touching this block and applying right where the force, oh, there it is. <laughs> There's the string touching this block and probably pulling it rightward. So I need to draw that force. I need rightward the force of tension on mass 2n to give it rightward acceleration. Okay, um, now before you call it done, uh, there's a check that I'd like you to get into habit of doing. I call it Newton's third law check. It's a check that you need to do whenever you are drawing free body diagrams for a system with two or more objects. Uh, it amounts to a check of, is this an internal force or external force? If it's an external force, great, you're done. Nothing else to worry about. If it's not an external force, if it's an internal force, then you need to identify the action-reaction force pairs. That's why Newton's third law says we need to have. So <laughs> whatever free body diagrams we draw should be consistent with that. So let me go through just each uh, of the uh, forces to go through for that check. The gravity, they are both external forces. They come from Earth. Earth is not part of our system. So there's going to be reaction force on Earth, but we are not drawing those. We're fine. Same thing with the normal force. They're not coming from Earth. They're coming from the table, but the table is not part of our system. We're not drawing any forces there, so we are fine. Um, apply the force. It's probably being applied by like a person who's not part of our system, so that's also external. 
Now, when you look at this tension force, this is where you have to be a little bit of care, a little bit careful. You might be thinking, oh, tension force, it's coming from this uh, string, which is uh, not part of our system. So you might be thinking it's external force, but keep following the string and notice that the string is also attached to here. Um, so it's not always, but in arrangements like this, you might find that uh, tension force kind of acts like a, a mediator between two blocks. So um, in this case of tension force, I would treat it as a uh, as an internal force. This tension force is being exerted through the string by this block M. So I need to have the reaction force on block M. It's equal in magnitude, so that's why I'm going to use the same letter for both of them, and it's opposite in direction, as Newton's third law says. Uh, in such situations where you have pulleys and other things that could uh, redirect the tension force, the way you approach it might be a little bit different, um, but just uh, watch out for that, <laughs> that when you identify tension force on one object, you also have to remember there might be tension force in on other objects. Here, I would describe this kind of like when you turn start law pair. And um, it's, uh, at this point, it is easy to forget um, some information given in the question, which is why I always, you know, take the time to diagram stuff as I, you know, go through the question. And I notice that I haven't, um, I haven't used this information. They gave us a, a coefficient of kinetic friction. And when you look at my free body diagram, I haven't drawn any friction force because I'm so used to trying to ignore friction force. Now, when a question explicitly tells you about friction force, then you can't ignore them anymore. You have to account for them. So let me account for them. Um, so for this block, I should, so they are both all gonna be moving to the right. So friction force should, should be leftward to kind of reduce the sliding. So let me draw a leftward friction force one, and I'll be using that later to actually work out what that is. And on block two M, there will also be leftward friction force two. So, all right, now we ask the question again. Did we draw all the forces? <laughs> and hopefully at this point you can, uh, you can say yes, both the blocks, from our intuition, we think they should be accelerating to the right, and uh, we've drawn enough forces to make that happen. And for every single thing that's touching the blocks somehow, we've accounted for some form of force that we anticipate being there. So, so we're done. Good. That was <laughs> I think ten minutes. But as I was saying, you know, free, drawing free body diagram, that's the step where it takes the most care. Once you've done that step correctly, then the rest is almost automatic, uh, mechanical. Um, you should be able to do it in your sleep. <laughs> um, so let me do that. Um, so uh, not sleep, but you know, just do it. So step number two, we need to define our axis. So I'm gonna just use simple axis of you know rightward being positive x and upward being y, uh, so that x is along the acceleration. And I think for this question, I can use the same axis for both blocks. Um, they don't have to be, but here, you know, same axis makes sense for both. I've done that. The third step is break um, forces into components. Here, all the forces are either horizontal or vertical. So there's nothing to break into components, so I'm done. And Finally, we need to write down Newton's second law equations. And if you've done steps one through three well and correctly, then step number four is kind of a mechanical step where all you're doing is just copying down the information that you already have in this diagram. So as you're doing step number four, all you should need to do is just copy that down in the form of mathematical equation. So let me do that. Uh, I know I'm going to need minimum of four equations, or I'll start with the four equations. I need an equation for each object and for each uh, dimension, each direction. So I have two objects, each of which have x and y direction. So two times two, four. That's how many equations I'll have. 
So, um, so yeah, let's just start out with the first uh, um, first equation. So, um, <laughs> let me label them so I don't get them mixed up. So I'm gonna need the equation one for x direction, and also equation one for y direction, equation two for x direction, and equation two for y direction. So I'll say equation one for x direction. So it's going to result in some acceleration. I'll label it A is equal to um, the net force. So I'm looking at this diagram here. Uh, in the x direction, I have the applied force F, I have tension force T, and friction force. I'm going to write my equation so that the directions are indicated in the equation. So all my quantities should be positive. So that looks like F minus tension minus the friction force, that's the net force, that divided by the mass, that would be that big M there, that's equal to acceleration. Good, one down, three, two. In the y direction, um, it, it's no acceleration, zero. That's kind of how we set it up on purpose. We have two forces, and uh, in other questions, we might have skipped it, you know, saying, oh, nothing interesting happens in the y direction. In this question, I have a sense because we have friction, we'll have to worry about uh, normal force, <laughs> which we get from the y direction. So let me write it down. So uh, we have normal force, upward the normal force, minus gravity, mg. And that, uh, let me just finish writing this. That divided by mass is equal to two. Uh, I could kind of get rid of mass multiplying both sides by m. That's fine. <laughs> let's keep going. Two more to go. So for mass to m, uh, let's write. So it's going to be accelerating to the right. And here, pause a little bit and convince yourself that uh, both masses are accelerating with the same magnitude of acceleration. So that we can justify using the same letter for both of them. In cases where somehow that's not true, you have to use different letters. Uh, we have tension force pulling it to right. Uh, minus the friction force, F2, that's the net force, divided by 2m, um, that's our uh, uh, acceleration for uh, block 2m. And in the y direction, do the same thing, 0 is equal to n2 minus 2mg divided by uh, 2m. Let's be careful here. Um, Okay, so we got four equations. Uh, let me count the number of unknowns to make sure that we have enough information, by which I mean equations, to solve this system of equations. <laughs> um, so acceleration, while they're not asking for it, I also don't know it. So this is an unknown, one. They apply the force, we are given that, so good. Don't need it. Tension, they're asking for it, so it's unknown. Friction force, we do have the coefficients, but not the force. So this is an unknown. Sorry, uh, make me nervous. Uh, mass, we know them. Uh, normal force, okay. Uh, we're not given them, so that's another unknown. And one, mass known, okay. Uh, tension, it's unknown, but I already counted it. No need to count it again. Uh, friction force two, that's an unknown. Five. And uh, normal force two, that's another unknown, six. So we have six unknowns, four equations. So what that means is, so, you know, the following the standard strategy landed us here, and that's great deal of progress forward. And sometimes if you are lucky, the equations that you have written down will be it. You have four equations, four unknowns, you go ahead and solve it. Questions like this one, uh, you might have four equations and six unknowns. <laughs> so you need to find two more equations. And that those two more equations, they'll come from using the given pieces of information, uh, like a coefficient of kinetic friction. You hopefully remember the given coefficient of kinetic friction that you can say this about the friction force. So F1 should be the coefficient mu1 times the normal force that's associated with this surface, so n1. And it's encouraging in that when I look at this, my fifth equation, 
there's uh, no additional unknown introduced here. All the F1 and 1, they were all counted before. And I can write the same thing for F2 is equal to mu2 times m2. That's my sixth equation. So I have six equations, six unknowns. I should be able to solve for it. Let's uh, solve for it. Oh, you know, um, so I could solve for it uh, by hand. But I feel like this is a good uh, opportunity to demonstrate the tool that I really want you to um, think about using and uh, get good at using, which is uh, Sage Math. So Sage Math is super efficient in solving simple system of equations like this. Simple in that they don't involve trig functions and um, and at the same time, you know, doing this by hand it's tedious. So, so let me launch Sage Math and just uh, do this on Sage Math. I think that can help me save a little bit of time and also help demonstrate use of this great tool that I want you to use. Uh, computer algebra system, professionals use it all the time in their work when they need to work out math. So sometimes I've seen where people struggle with algebra, especially later on when we get to static equilibrium. Um, where the, you could have a lot of equations, each one of which is simple. And um, a tool like CH Math it can be something that helps you get through that hurdle, like, you know, in your other math classes, like if you have trouble multiplying two three-digit numbers, you don't let this stop you, you just use calculator. And this is like a calculator for symbolic computation. So I need to define my, my variable, so let me do that. Acceleration, tension, uh, friction force one, normal force one, friction force two, normal force two, and I think I forgot something. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, okay, that's it. So those are all my variables, oh, but I also need to define my known quantities. Um, I'll plug in numbers for them later, but I need F for force F m for mass n, reference mass n, and oh, g for gravitational acceleration. I think that's it. Uh, if uh, I miss something, it will complain later. So I need to define my equation. So let me just write down my equations. Equation one, that's my um, acceleration, is equal to, there's a difference between this single equal sign and double equal sign. This is an assignment symbol. This is the equality symbol. Uh, that's f minus t minus f1 divided by n. And just to make sure I typed it correctly. And I'll type in the remainder of the equation without talking so much. Um, mostly in the interest of time. Um, And you have to make sure you always put in this multiplication symbol. Sage math doesn't understand imply the multiplication. It's a contrast with your um, uh, my open math, which does understand implied multiplication. Oh, I didn't define mu. Uh, okay, I need to define those mu one and mu two. Okay, let's just uh, uh, put them into an array. Equation one, equation two, equation three, equation four, equation five, equation six, and make sure I did, wrote them down correctly. They look correctish, correct enough. <laughs> so in Sage Math, there's a function called solve. Oh, let me just bring up the help tools for solve so that you can see. Um, the kind of documentation that's available within Sage Math. This is one of the reasons I recommend using this interactive version and not, uh, I mean, there's an online Sage Math cell that uh, you can use without installing anything on your computer. Uh, the downside is that it's harder to use those to look up this documentation. I mean, you can, but it's harder, more cumbersome. So it's an example like this, that's what I'll follow. So this syntax is exactly what I want. Uh, I'll have it solve for all the quantities and I'm just gonna need attention from that. Um, so, okay. So I'm gonna have it solve my equations 
for the unknowns that we have identified, let me say, um, oh, wait, sorry, I didn't like to see. Uh, and it's solving for multiple, okay, yeah, just, okay. <laughs> so, equations. Um, for let me put tension first, uh, so they will come first. The rest of the variables I don't really care, but I still kind of need to specify them so that I'm telling Sage Math that um, um, these are my unknowns, and the rest are known quantities. So um, Sage Math will treat like F and M and the uh, mu ones and two mu one and two as known quantities and just to uh, uh, um, solve these, solve for these in terms of those known quantities. So we'll do that in a bit. Sometimes uh, computer algebra system will complain that uh, that it doesn't know if, I don't know, if M is positive. Uh, computer algebra systems tend to deal with these in a very general way. Uh, so for more complicated equations involving square roots and whatnot, it might complain that there's a syntax you can use to tell SageMath what to assume. Uh, so, okay, so it solved everything. And really all I need is, um, um, all I need is really this first element. So let me get at that. That's the first element, which is the first set of solution, the only set of solution, and the first element of that. So I think that will give me that, yeah. So let me plug in the numbers that they give us. Um, so this there's a syntax for it. It's the substitution syntax. Let me make sure. Yeah, <laughs> um, and you can substitute with something like this. You say f is equal to oh 13 newtons, and I'm just gonna do everything in basic SI units that I'll make all the units work out right. Um, my m is equal to 0 pi, 0 0.8 kilogram. My mu1 is equal to, I labeled it there, that's why I labeled it, uh, 0.29, and my mu2 is 0.22, and my g is equal to 9.8 meter per second squared. I think that's all. Let's see what it gives us. Okay, yeah, 8.3 Newton. So let's plug in the number and see that it's correct. So, um, yeah, th this is a... Um, so the part of problem solving that can't be automated is all of this. This is what's important to learn because um, uh, Sage Math can't set up these equations for you. You have to come up with the you know, ultimate question for the machine to be able to answer. And once you have the set of equations, then getting an answer, it's just a matter of learning a relatively simple programming language. So, okay. Uh, I hope I didn't. I know I didn't make any mistake this time. Um, so, so yeah, I think I don't think this is any shorter than the one I have before, though. I think this is just a complex, complex question.